Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our first Empower Connect series for 2021. My name is Karima Hayward, and I will be chairing this stream today. I hope this morning's sessions will be valuable to you. Here at Empower Connect, we aim to create a meaningful opportunity for fund buyers and asset owners to learn about the best new funds out there from the portfolio managers themselves, understand the strategy, and learn a bit about the person behind the fund. We have three fund managers presenting this morning, 91, LFDE, Le Financier de l'Echiquier, and Salen Funds. I hope you can make all three presentations. For the order of play, please consult the schedule, which you'll find to the left of your screen. There should be time for Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please submit your questions on Slido to the right of your screen, and, make, and we'll make sure that they're answered. You can also select the stream, so we are stream B. For more information about the fund managers presenting today, check out the sponsor tab to learn more. So without further ado, I'm in, delighted to introduce John Stopford, Head of Multi-Asset Income of 91, who will be on, in conversation with Richard Garland, Managing Director, Global Advisor. Richard, over to you. Karina, thank you very much. John, nice to see you. Morning, so, Richard. Um, we very much position this as a conversation because what we wanted to do was address some of the key issues um, in the markets today, uh, talk to you about what we think you and your clients are concerned about, um, and really then show you why the 91 Global Multi-Asset Income Fund is what we think a perfect solution for these very tough markets at the moment. So as Karina said, um, I'm Richard Garland. Um, I've been at 91 for about 15 years, and I'm head of our global advisor business. And John has been at 91 for twice as long as me, 30 years plus. And John is uh, head of our global multi-asset income strategies. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a brief update about 91, talk about the key benefits of the global multi-asset income strategy. And then we're gonna have a, a discussion with John talking about what's going on in the markets today and really addressing your concerns. So I'm gonna start off quickly, give you an update on 91. Now, for those of you who may still not know the name 91, just to reassure you, uh, whilst it's a new name, we have been around a long time because we used to be called Investec Asset Management. And you may recall that in March or March the 16th, to be precise, last year, uh, we demerged from our parent company, Investec Group, and we then listed as an independent asset manager on the London and Johannesburg stock exchanges. And as part of our demerger, we came up with a new name. People say, why 91? Very straightforward. That was the year in which we were founded in South Africa. Now, a couple of points I just want to bring out on this slide to really highlight what makes us different. First of all, 23% of the company is owned by the employees. So we are a public listed company, but we uh, own 23% of the company. In fact, every single employee at 91 is a shareholder in 91. The other thing is that we began in South Africa, which means we look at the world differently. Obviously, not obviously, we have a lot of expertise in emerging markets, but we've grown out of South Africa into a major global asset manager with investment offices in London, in New York, in Hong Kong and Singapore. But we still have very much that emerging market perspective as part of our DNA. So let's look now at the Global Multi-Asset Income Fund, just to tell you some of the key points on it. And these points we think are very relevant today. I mean, at one time you can look at the markets, maybe two or three weeks, two, two or three weeks ago, and you think, we're off to the races. The reflation trade is back. It's where, where the economy is opening up around the world. The vaccinations are piling in. And therefore, you know, why do you need a defensive total return fund in this environment? And then you know, fast forward two weeks and suddenly the markets are all over the place again. When we look at global multi-asset income and what it can do for you and your clients, it is very much a defensive total return fund with income at the core. In other words, what that means is 
the actual performance of the fund basically relies upon income generating securities. In fact, 90% of the total return of the fund comes from income. And you can see a tra an attractive, resilient yield of around about 4%. Now, clearly, 4% today is incredibly attractive with negative yields uh, all around the world and very low yields from all other types of income uh, securities. But the most important thing which you want to highlight as why it works now is it gives you bond-like volatility. So it very much is a perfect solution for these tough markets with low volatility, good income and a defensive total return. So let's briefly then look at the performance signature of the fund. And you can see that this fund uh, launched um, in 2013 has never had a negative year. I mean, that's a, that's a big deal for clients who really are concerned about really uh, their clients having any form of negative return. So if you go back and look at the bottom of this slide, you can see the year on year performance where, and I'll highlight a couple of years in 2018, which you'll remember was a tough year. We ended up, uh, John and I ended up creating a return of 1.2%. And last year, which was a year like no other, the fund was also positive 5.7%. So what it's managed to do is generate returns over five years, as you can see, of about 5.2% per annum, but with a volatility of only 4%. 4 and you can see that very attractive straight line with the cumulative performance. So we think this fund should be very much at the core of your portfolio. So now, John, that's the, uh, the brief summary on the fund. What I want to do now with John is just ask him a couple of questions and really get to the nub of the issue. So, John, um, and we put these slides together about three weeks ago. Um, my first question was, markets are riding at all-time highs, but now, of course, things have uh, changed a little bit. But there's still this whole belief, John, that you know we're, go we're going to see a reflation trade. We're going to see um, um, the economies coming back. Uh, we're going to see a huge fiscal stimulus, clearly, um, in, the in the U.S. with President Biden of $1.9 trillion. So really, what our clients are asking us, you know, why would I want a defensive total return fund if we're back to the races, is everything's going to be beautiful, and I just need to, you know, back the hold on because euphoria is back. So what is your answer to that question, John? So, so the simplest answer is um, markets don't move in a straight line. Uh, and there are plenty of investors who don't have the risk budget to just sit in equities the whole time. The, the sort of more complicated answer, I think, is we live in a world that's been um, distorted by incredibly cheap money, um, excessive fiscal policy and lots of other big issues. Too much debt, aging demographics, um, <laughs> covid you name it. So it's an inherently very unstable environment and periods where markets boom and periods where markets bust. And, and the incidence of market bust um, seems to have been much more pervasive uh, post the GFC than before, as central banks have tried to you know, win the fight of, of against sort of the downside risk by just doing more and more and more. Uh, and that just creates these bubbles that, that burst periodically. So we've had more frequent uh, episodes of down, you know, 10, 15, 20% on equities or more. Uh, and now we also face the risk that uh, bond yields might rise. So uh, policy may have reached its sort of low point in terms of uh, of interest rates and might, might be reversing if, if central banks are more successful than they thought. And I guess the other concern is there's massive herding. And one of the ways that you could look at that is looking at various measures of sentiment, of valuation. This is uh, the AAII bull versus bear measure, which is getting somewhat elevated. Um, but there are lots of other things that suggest a lot of stock markets are pretty expensive. A lot of individual sectors and stocks are, are very boomy. Bonds are pretty expensive in, in you know, certain areas and so on. Uh, and that just sets up markets for you know, fragility. So if, if anything goes wrong, and I can think of two things that might go wrong. One is that mutant strains of COVID just mean that the longed for exit is much messier and, and growth doesn't recover in the, the way that markets are currently pricing. 
And the other is maybe things are too good and we start to worry about inflation, bond yields back up, central banks are sort of forced into a corner uh, and cheap money gets taken away sooner than, than people expect. So, you know, the, the capacity for accidents post the GFC looks greater than, than it was. And you can see that in terms of, you know, the drawdown episodes that we've experienced over the last, um, you know, five, 10 uh, years. They've been bigger, more frequent. So the, the, the uh, orange or, or pink line here, the salmon line is the MSCI. Uh, we've also shown a group of, of multi-asset income funds in sort of uh, gray green. Uh, and then the dark color is us. And, and what we think is important, if you're trying to deliver a smoother, more defensive total return, it's not just about capturing the upside, it's about protecting the downside. And ideally, cutting risk uh, at appropriate times, um, de-risking the portfolio, and then re-risking it when the opportunity is there, when you've had a, a, a drawdown or when um, things are, are calming down. And, and so if this is just showing the downside, what I think we've done quite effectively is protect in periods of market stress, but then also recovered pretty quickly uh, when the stress uh, um, has passed or the episode has happened. Um, and the way that we've done that really has been in a, a number of ways. Partly it's, it's how we build the portfolio. We se select individual securities for three things. Yield, yes, but we don't just chase yield because that's dangerous. We're looking for yield with safety. We're looking for uh, companies that have resilient cash flows underpinning those yields that we can rely on, which gives them good protective qualities in times of market stress. We're making sure that the overall level of risk is bond-like. We're running a low level of volatility overall by diversifying by uh, security, by behavior. Uh, and then we're, we're reducing risk tactically at times of market stress. And this is showing on this chart, physical equity exposure hasn't changed a lot over time. But the, the net equity allowing for hedges has varied quite a lot. So over the first five years or so, it was around 25% up or down a bit as we protected from time to time in periods of market stress. We then had a much more difficult market environment in 2018. We'd started de-risking at the end of 2017, and that gave us essentially a positive return when most assets were down. Uh, we began to rebuild risk, and then COVID hit, and we were reducing risk going into that. Um, and then we reduced risk pretty aggressively. We got down to a net equity position of about 7% in sort of mid-March uh, 2020 and then have rebuilt since. But actually, it wasn't equities that drove the performance last year. It was credit where we added back to high yield and longer dated investment grade, which had got completely caned by uh, um, market stress and market um, uh, panic. Uh, and actually, we, we think was a better investment in terms of a, a sort of defensive total return, uh, an income driven total return in, in 2020. Um, so, yeah, so that that's we, we think defense makes sense because it's an incredibly uncertain environment and some people need more predictability in their lives. So, John, it's, it's kind of it's what the name of the fund, multi asset income. And now when you mention the word income, people are nervous and you know I, I deal with our clients all around the world and their clients so the end investor um, most of them have a huge need for income and they worry about where to find income because they're clearly worried about potentially interest rates going up and then the value of their you know, income securities going down and they, they feel that maybe you know, government bonds no longer play the place in the portfolio that they do used to do so they really don't quite know what to do with the income part of their portfolio so um i mean the way you manage the global multi-asset income fund is you've got income at the center, but then of course you could say, well, isn't that a bit risky because you've got obviously potentially rising interest rates. You've also had huge dividend cuts with companies no longer being able to generate that dividend payments. So how do you do it? And is that maybe a risk in the portfolio that you have such a focus on income? Uh, no, we, we think we're providing a solution to all those investors who have the problem that, that you uh, talked about. And uh, I guess the clue is in the name. This is a multi-asset income fund, not a fixed income fund. So we are looking across, and it's global, so we're looking across something like 25,000 securities, looking for 
a combination, yes, of income, but also reliability. We're trying to find individual securities. This is much more driven from the bottom up than the top down. Individual securities that have the right balance of a decent yield, not necessarily a spectacular yield, but one that is very solidly underpinned by uh, cash flows and also is well valued. Um, so we're looking for cheap, high quality uh, um, cash flows that, that can drive the return and provide that defensive quality as well. But we're not just running fixed income and we're, we're deliberately at the moment trying to actually shy away from running uh, too much duration and looking for opportunities elsewhere. And just to show how important income is, and, and we think, you know, clearly you can generate returns from income or capital growth. But over the long run, most asset classes, it's income that's important. It's income that's reliable. Capital growth uh, comes and goes, gains and losses. Even in the case of equity, we would argue on this slide that the sort of red bar is, under, uh, is sort of overstated because some of that capital appreciation is essentially share buybacks, which is just a more tax efficient way, for example, for a lot of US companies to distribute the, the cash that they generate. So, you know, in reality, income is pretty dominant across all asset classes. And it's the most reliable, particularly if you're looking for securities with uh, um, resilient uh, cash flows. Um, and yes, there's a breadth of stuff out there. So with that, in a universe of 25,000 securities, we think we can find 300 or so that are going to give you the right mix of risk and return. Um, and you mentioned uh, dividend cuts. Actually, for us, that's a huge opportunity. So we were well positioned last year in companies that didn't uh, struggle with their dividends um, mostly because um, we'd done the work to make sure that they had uh, the cash flows to um, mean that they'd be comfortable, even in a more difficult, more challenged economic environment, to continue to pay to pay dividends. Now the opportunity is for dividends to bounce back. So you can see here on this chart on the left-hand side, clearly you get a higher yield in high dividend yielding stocks. But actually, because they were sort of out of favor last year, courtesy of, of all the concerns from, from the sort of COVID crisis, um, they bounce back. I mean, they, they're, sorry, they're, they're, they're much more appropriately valued. So you've got cheap, uh, high quality uh, dividend yielding stocks, which can provide quite a lot of the income in the portfolio in a risk controlled way, in a diversified way. And then, yes, we don't want to own necessarily government bonds in any great degree, although some are becoming more interesting. So, you know, selectively in places like New Zealand, the market's now pricing in a rapid return of higher interest rates. Um, but then beyond, you know, uh, developed markets, we think there are uh, increasing uh, opportunities in higher quality um, uh, emerging markets, particularly ones with relatively steep yield curves. So this chart's just showing actually if you strip out the currency, if you hedge currency risk back to base, you avoid taking the exchange rate risk of emer owning emerging market bonds, just own the bonds hedge back to, uh, to dollars or, or euros. Um, you basically take out most of the volatility. That's essentially what the table is saying and what the chart is showing. Um, so we think that's a, a, a cheap way of, of earning uh, a yield at the moment. Um, and then you've got some opportunities still within high yield, within corporate bonds, although that looks more extended. So overall, we think it's still very achievable, particularly building a portfolio from se the security level to, to achieve this kind of trade-off. This is showing the yield on the fund on the, the left-hand axis around 4% and the volatility along the bottom, very bond-like, similar to government bonds or investment grade. So we, we're able to uh, generate a yield on a consistent basis that's similar to the kind of yield you get in high yield or emerging market local debt, um, much better than equity, but to do that with bond-like risk characteristics. And, and that's essentially all we're looking to do. We're not trying to beat the S&P. We're not trying to beat the Barclays Ag. We're trying to deliver consistent yield and consistent returns with low volatility. Okay, so that's, I mean, I want to ask you about the emerging market debt a little bit more, and you can go back to that slide if you want to, because 
we get pushback a lot of the time when people when we say to people our clients that this is a defensive total return fund and they say but why have you got emerging market debt in it now obviously you spoke about you know you can take the carry you can hedge away the currency but i just want you to go back because i do think this is such an interesting point and uh, if you look at that slide and i'm going to highlight the point but i think it's so interesting if you look at the maximum drawdown for us treasuries of minus six percent and you look at the maximum drawdown for hedged EM government bonds, it's the same and the same volatility. And it's almost counterintuitive um, that it, it is this has the same risk. So John, talk a little bit more about EMD because I want people to understand how, how you do it and you don't just own the whole market, but just go a little bit more detail because this is, to me, one of the best kept secrets about the global multi-asset income fund. Yeah, and it's only part of what we do. We're doing lots of other things in, in developed government bonds, in corporate bonds, in equity, in listed property, and so on. So this is a portion of the fund, but we do think it's a, a hugely exciting opportunity set. So risk in fixed income, you can break down uh, across a whole range of, of areas. You, it, there's clearly credit risk if you lend to lower quality borrowers. There's interest rate risk, You know the yield curve moving up and down. Uh, and then there's currency risk. If you buy something in a foreign currency, you can hedge out the currency risk by basically selling that currency in the forward market. Uh, and it's, you know, it's the most liquid market in the world. It's very finely priced. Um, and essentially, you then create a bond that, that is um, crudely denominated in whatever your, your base currency is, and you're earning a yield that's the yield less the, the cost of hedging. And these days, emerging markets the cost of hedging is very low because like everywhere else, they've cut their interest rates uh, down to very low levels. But what you're left with typically is a market where the yield curve is very steep because investors demand a risk premium. Um, but you can select which markets you own, which bonds you own, and, and pick the ones where you think the risk pre premium is, is massively overstated and you can diversify. So you can have very small amounts. So we've got duration exposure of less than half a year, around half a year in total across about uh, seven or eight markets in emerging markets, all predominantly hedged back. We've got a little bit of uh, currency risk because we want some, because we think commodity prices and China are doing very well. And that typically is a, a good environment for emerging markets. So idea, it's actually a very favorable backdrop for these types of markets, but you don't have to own them all. You don't have to own the really risky ones, you don't have to own the ones that have got big economic problems. Um, and the net effect of it on it is on a diversified basis, you earn the risk premium, but the risk actually isn't that high, particularly if you remove the currency angle, uh, as we suggested. Okay, I mean, I, I just want to drive that point home. I think it's fascinating. So now, biggest concern investors have, every conversation we have is inflation is going to pick up, interest rates are going to rise and we're looking into the abyss potentially so you pick i'm going to pick up a point you said that you hedge the duration which i'd like you to dwell upon a little bit more but what do you think about inflation is it coming back into the system and what are your thoughts about interest rate rising and when will that happen um okay so so i i think yes uh inflation is coming back um it'll come back just for uh, sort of base effects. You know, it was very soft last year. Oil prices are up a lot. They could go up further. You know, there's, there's going to be supply and demand mismatches as economies open. So there'll be a natural increase in inflation. It's about how persistent that is. But importantly, central banks want higher inflation. So, you know, the, the Fed, for example, have changed the way they behave to say, OK, if we see some inflation, we're not going to do anything initially because we want inflation to be higher for a period of time. But the issue is um, you've now got a set of policies which looks like it's got the best chance of creating in some inflation for some time. So you've got a, not just very easy monetary policy, which is unlikely to be tightened quickly, but you've got incredibly powerful fiscal policy. So, you know, the, the US latest package, $1.9 trillion, you know, it's sort of Dr. Evil territory. Um, you know, you're talking, you know, uh, 10% or 8% or something of US GDP in one shot on top of everything that's already come, you know, that's incredibly powerful at a time when, you know, economy is going to be bouncing back, you're going to have, um, uh, you know, some of the other negatives may be a little bit less uh, prevalent. So 
US demographics, for example, are beginning to improve. The sort of working age population is building again. Their balance sheets are very good. Housing markets booming. You've got lots of things that mean we could start to see more persistent inflation. Um, and the issue is, you know, is the Fed going to overcook it? And I think the risk is with fiscal policy being so generous. Yes, there, I think that risk is there which means that they may end up tightening sooner than they're currently saying, and that can spook the market, particularly when, as you see here, bond yields are on the floor. So we think fair value for bond yields is higher than, than current levels, and they can overshoot. Um, so you don't want to have a, a lot of duration. You want to have a portfolio that's relying on other things to generate the return, not on just owning lots of long-dated uh, treasuries, which are going to lose you money, or or you know investment grade corporate or whatever, and just to show how you know we've managed the duration risk. So on the left hand side, actually, you know our um, relationship to the equity market is pretty good. In months where equities are up, we've captured a th just over a third of the upside. In months where they're down, we've only captured twenty percent of the downside. So we've we've given people a positive skew in terms of equity markets. But we've given them an even more extreme positive skew in terms of bond markets. So in, in months where the bond market's been up, the fund's captured three quarters of that. But in months where it's been down, it's only captured 5%. So you know, we think this isn't a fund that's relying on bond market performance to drive it. It's relying on security selection and income. Um, and so we're pretty comfortable that we're well positioned if we do enter a more protracted bond bear market, which I think is is clearly a risk. And certainly if people are sitting in traditional fixed income, they should be worried about that. And they should be looking for things that they could own instead. And hopefully global multi-asset income is one of those. That's cool. So we're coming to the end of our session. Um, so uh, John, why don't you wrap up on the overall look of the portfolio? And then I will conclude with how we think a client should use this fund in their portfolio? Uh, yeah, so overall, this is a, a defensive total return fund driven by income of around 4% with bond-like volatility. So the volatility has been about four and a bit years. Uh, we're not relying on uh, bond duration to drive that return. So at the end of January, we had a duration of 1.9. It's actually been lower more recently. Um, it's pretty downside aware. We're making sure that in times where equities look pretty extended, we don't have a lot of net equity exposure. Uh, it's pretty defensive. The quality of the um, fixed income and the equities we own is, is very strong. And it's not a fund that's just being pushed up and down by the equity market. It's got uh, better performance to the upside, um, more protection to the downside, and an overall beta to equities that is pretty low. Okay, perfect. So what I'm going to do now is just talk to you about how you can use this fund for your clients and we've got three three ways of we think we should look at it first of all you know it's very much an income it's a, a solution strategy so we call it a defensive total return so very clear outcome and that's important because every single year john and the team have managed to generate a positive return so the whole approach has worked and you know that it can be that core position in your portfolio. But I think the salmon color is almost the most important thing now. This, is, this, this fund is the perfect bond replacement. You don't want to be in fixed income if we end up with an environment of inflation coming through, rising interest rates. That's going to have a huge impact on fixed income funds. So think of this fund as a bond replacement. So think of it as really that income generating part of your portfolio and the way that John runs it with that multi-asset approach using the equity hedges, using the duration hedge means he can navigate the turbulent times in the market and also deal with you know, rising interest rates. So really, we want you to think of this fund as a core building block in your clients' portfolios and use it really as the bond replacement because government bonds don't work anymore and are not going to give you that kind of income and stability that you need for your clients' portfolios. So that's a wrap from John and me. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. And if you have any further questions, please contact your salesperson from 91. So John, thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. And thanks everybody for listening in. Thank you both. That was a really great presentation.
Um, we, as, as Richard mentioned, um, if you have any questions, please do use slider to the right of the screen. Um, we can obviously share those with both of them and uh, get some answers for you. If you want more information on our fund managers, please click on the sponsors and partners page to learn more about them. And just before we go for a break, break the um, fund presentations will be available to watch Umbrella after the day ends through the stream tab. You'll be able to watch all the presentations until tomorrow, 3rd of March. Um, and we'll see you in 15 minutes for the next presentation from LFDE. Thank you. <laughs>